The author of Chip War outlines the dominance of the biggest players in the semiconductor space, but also how dependent they are on trust. The entire supply chain depends on just a small number of irreplaceable companies. And so there's not a single country that can make cutting edge ships on its own. We can't live without TSMC. And if we were to lose access to it, we face the greatest disruption to global manufacturing since the Great Depression. It's Monday, the 28th of August, and you're watching Markets with Madison. NVIDIA has just shown investors what it looks like to crush a quarter. Data center revenue absolutely taking off, doubling its total revenue in a year. The forecast suggests how reliant the world is now becoming on these companies. But with that much power also comes plenty of risks. NVIDIA is one of very few players that are critical to the semiconductor supply chain, one that's been built up over decades but is now rapidly trying to diversify. The biggest semiconductor manufacturer in the world, TSMC, is spending 10 billion euros building a fab in Germany to produce 40,000 computer chips a month by the end of 2027, while South Korean chip company Samsung is spending 17 billion US dollars on a facility in Texas. It's the latest in a rush to diversify a fragile supply chain for a commodity possibly more crucial than oil. Semiconductors power almost everything we touch every day. Our smartphones, laptops, cars, dishwashers, fridges, LED lights. The powerful chips are mostly made of silicon and of billions of super tiny transistors that conduct electricity and create computing power. The most advanced versions are now powering artificial intelligence. Every chip requires numerous compartments, processes, companies and countries. The supply chain begins with design, the bulk of which happens in the United States, with companies like NVIDIA or AMD. But the equipment needed to design them are made in three countries, the US, Japan and the Netherlands. But when it comes to actually making them, there's only three players, Taiwan's TSMC, Korea's Samsung and America's Intel. TSMC makes more than 90% of the advanced chips needed for technology. But it's in possibly the most politically precarious position in the world. Taiwan is at the center of escalating tensions between China and the US. So what do we do? Is it too far gone or should governments be making efforts to rely less on each other? Historian Chris Miller is the author of Chip War, a number one bestseller, who spent five years researching the semiconductor supply chain. In this interview, he stresses just how reliant all the players and politicians are on each other. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for being here. I've been really looking forward to this chat. I'm excited to be here. Your book not only highlighted how dependent the world is on chips, but also how dependent our reliance on chips is on just very few companies. How fragile is the supply chain? And is that the word that you'd use to describe it? Well, I, th I think it is fragile. The entire supply chain depends on just a small number of irreplaceable companies. There's often just one company in the world that knows how to do its specific task at cutting edge levels. And if you look at all of the unique parts of the supply chain in the ship industry, uh, what you find is that there are single points of failure throughout. So the best example is the manufacturing of advanced processor chips in Taiwan, where one company has 90% market share uh, in manufacturing the chips that are in all of our smartphones, in our computers, and all of the data centers that we rely on. I definitely do want to talk to you specifically about the dominance of TSMC, but could you explain, and I know this is a very big question, but the whole supply chain to me, and sort of perhaps who has the most production market share, right through to, to who has the most consumer reliance, and the monopolistic or oligopolistic statuses within all of that? So to Make an advanced semiconductor first requires accessing uh, very complex software tools that are capable of designing semiconductors. And these software tools are almost exclusively made by US firms. It has by far the dominant market share. You also need really complex machine tools that are capable of moving materials at almost an atomic level. And these tools are made by just three countries, the Netherlands, Japan, and the United States. Then you need to understand how to design chips for different use cases. Some chips work in smartphones, others in computers, others uh, in uh, cars, for example. And uh, there's a number of companies that design chips at the 
cutting edge level of technology in different spheres, but most of the key design firms, companies like NVIDIA or AMD are based in the US. And then finally, there's the actual manufacturing. And this is where companies in Taiwan and Korea have uh, more advanced capabilities than anyone else in the world. And so there's not a single country that can make cutting edge ships on its own. You need collaboration between the Netherlands, the US, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan to make almost every single type of advanced ship. When you were researching all of these companies and also all of these economies that contribute to this massive supply chain, what stood out to you? Was there anything about the cultural history of these really dominant players that surprised you? I think the, the really striking thing is how integrated they all are. Uh, on the one hand, they all have extraordinarily unique capabilities and intellectual property that they try very hard to defend and keep secret, but they also all need to collaborate with each other because a supply chain this long only works if each of the pieces fits together. And so there's a strange dynamic of companies with ultra secret processes that nevertheless trust their suppliers and their customers enough to share this data uh, so that they can all make technological advances at the same speed and stay coordinated. And that's something that requires just extraordinary levels of trust across the industry. Everyone talks about the trust that's needed uh, to have these trade secrets, but be willing to share them with select other, uh, other companies. The market has very clearly picked winners like NVIDIA. And as you mentioned, TSMC is obviously a very big player as well. But given that they're all so reliant on each other, is picking winners kind of the wrong approach? I mean, if anyone loses, then they all lose, right? Well, there's no other option because the technology involved is so complex and so R&D and capital intensive uh, to produce that paying for uh, alternative suppliers is often just too expensive. So if you take, for example, the production of lithography machines, just one of the types of machine tools you need to make an advanced ship. There's just one company in the world, ASML in the Netherlands, that has 100% market share, the only company that can produce these machines. But it took this company three decades to learn how to make these machines in a commercially viable way. So if any other company tried to go along that learning curve three decades later, they have no market uh, to support the development. And so you sort of need monopolies in certain parts of the supply chain just because the expense involved is so high. And you know, the capital investment involved in chip making is just exorbitant. The new chip making facility costs $20 billion, the most expensive factories in human history. And so no startup is going to enter this sphere. Good luck raising $20 billion for your startup. It's just not going to happen. I don't think there even is $20 billion left in Silicon Valley, even if somebody wanted to right now. So based off that, it seems like competition with any of these big players is completely out of the picture. Would you agree with that? They, they compete to some extent amongst each other. But what you find is that in many segments of the chip industry, companies have very deep moats and they've often been in their market positions for years, if not decades. TSMC specifically, how precarious of a position is that company in and how critical is it? Well, their, their market position is enviable, but their geographic position uh, is potentially problematic. If you look at their market position, they've been the leader in providing manufacturing services, outsourced manufacturing for companies like Apple, NVIDIA, AMD for many years now. They've got this extraordinary market share and they're deeply intertwined with their customers. Apple, for example, relies on TSMC to produce every single one of the primary processors in each new iPhone. So Apple couldn't survive without uh, TSMC providing its chips every single year. And that's why TSMC today is the largest publicly traded company in Asia, one of the largest in the world. But because it's not only headquartered in Taiwan, but almost all of its capacity today is currently in Taiwan, it's, of course, hugely exposed uh, to the risk that China tries to escalate militarily against Taiwan, either via a blockade uh, or an outright attack. And you see major investors in TSMC asking tough questions about this concentration. Warren Buffett, for example, uh, uh, made into headlines really this year by selling his uh, TSMC stock. And he apparently didn't have any problems with the business model. He was just worried about the geopolitical risk. If tensions do escalate and if you do have a, a Chinese blockade or a Chinese attack, TSMC is in trouble, but the whole electronics industry is in trouble because everyone relies on TSMC. You know, People like you and me have never actually purchased a TSMC product. But TSMC components are in everything we rely on, our phones, our computers, the telecoms infrastructure that lets us uh, surf the internet on our phones, our dishwashers, our automobiles. We can't live without TSMC. And if we were to lose access to it, we'd face the greatest disruption to global manufacturing since the Great Depression. 
Do you view that as a problem to be fixed? Do we all need to become more self-sufficient and rely less on TSMC? Well, I think TSMC has already recognized the, the challenge, which is why they've begun building new manufacturing facilities in Japan and the United States. Uh, and just this week announced a new facility uh, in Germany that they're in construction on later this year. So they're beginning to diversify their manufacturing base. Uh, but I also think that this is going to happen slowly. Right now, almost all of TSMC's manufacturing is in Taiwan. I think in five years' time, we're still going to have at least 80% of TSMC's capacity being in Taiwan. So there's a change, uh, but it's a slow change because TSMC has built up so much capacity in Taiwan over the past 30 years, even if they invest a lot overseas. Uh, the, the share that uh, is outside of Taiwan just moves really slowly. So even if we are getting diversification and more onshoring, it's actually not going to be enough. It's actually really not going to move the dial, is it? It moves the dial very slowly. Well, there are these efforts to onshore. Economies are making these efforts in a way to sort of put pressure on those sort of choke points you've spoken about in the supply chain. What do you think are the intended but also unintended consequences of those types of moves? I think the intended consequences are simply to bolster the chip manufacturing base in the US, in Japan, in Europe. India is also spending a lot of money trying to build up a, a chip industry. And all of these countries are looking at the concentration of chip manufacturing in East Asia, and especially on both sides of the Taiwan Straits, and getting nervous. But I, I think there are going to be some unintended consequences. I, I do worry uh, somewhat about the uh, amount of money going into the fabrication of lagging edge chips, more mature technologies, the types that are in cars, and dishwashers. And here it's actually, it's not Europe or the US or Japan that are the major players, it's actually China. Uh, the Chinese government is spending roughly as much as the rest of the world combined each year trying to subsidize its own chip industry. And right now, China is far behind when it comes to cutting edge chip technologies. But if you look at older technologies, like those that are in household goods or consumer electronics, uh, China's got all the capabilities it needs to manufacture at home. And the government's been pouring billions and billions of dollars each year. And so we already know, based on factories that are under construction in China right now, that in a couple of years, when they're online, there's going to be a glut of overcapacity coming out of China in these mature technologies. And that's going to be the biggest unintended consequence, I think, when you look at government policies in this area. It sounds like, though, if it's such a risk that we don't have enough of these and so much of that supply and production is concentrated, then why would having too many chips be a bad thing? Won't our demand for them eventually catch up? Well, you know, you got to look at different segments of the industry differently. So during the pandemic, there was a Excuse me. During the pandemic, there was a deficit of the types of chips that went in cars and industrial goods. Those are very different semiconductors than the types of chips that are in your smartphone or types of chips that are training AI applications in data centers. Now we've got plenty of chips for cars, but a deficit of chips for AI applications. And indeed, the shortage is so severe that right now in Silicon Valley, there are venture capital firms that are no longer giving out dollars to their startups. They're just handing out AI chips because that's what's really in deficit in Silicon Valley. But those are chips that are only manufactured in Taiwan, advanced AI chips. China can't make them domestically. And so as China spends and spends and subsidizes and subsidizes, we're going to get not more AI chips. We're going to get more of the types of chips that go in cars and dishwashers. And so it's a risk for existing companies in Taiwan, in the US, in Japan, in Europe that currently produce these chips because they're going to face the exact same dynamics that solar panel makers faced five years ago or that steel makers faced as well as a huge surge of Chinese capacity comes online. Look, Chris, when I was telling my audience that I was interviewing you, a lot of the questions that came through to me was about something that you've kind of just mentioned earlier. It was about this demand and boom in AI and quantum computing and the sort of draw on supply that that's currently having. So given that we now have more applications, ChatGPT being one of them, how do you see that changing the demand dynamics? And what can or should the industry do to try to fix that, other than possibly handing out more AI chips to startups? <laughs> well, I think right now we're seeing a surge in demand for chips for training AI systems, whether it's OpenAI or Anthropic. Um, all of the new startups that are focused on training large language models are requiring huge numbers of GPUs for that purpose. But in 10 years time, I think we're going to be using more chips for inference than for training. In other words, asking ChatGPT questions rather than training new versions of ChatGPT. And inference is going to look different in different use cases. So the 
type of chip that you want to use for asking chat GPT questions might be a different type of chip than a chip in your car that's running inference applications on autonomous driving uh, uh, use cases. And so I think the inference market is in its early stages. We're seeing lots of companies compete for market share in different segments of that market. But that's actually where there's even more growth opportunity because there will be lots of models that are trained, but there'll be even more demand to use those models. And if you wanna use an AI model, you've gotta have a chip that's optimized for inference. Do you foresee more companies like we're seeing with Amazon sort of following Apple's lead in terms of designing and manufacturing their own chips? Is that something that we should expect to see more of? No, that certainly has been a trend among companies that operate big data centers. You've also seen some auto companies uh, enter the chip design business, but it's a tricky, uh, a tricky challenge for many companies. First, the cost is tremendous. Designing a cutting edge chip costs half a billion dollars before you've manufactured anything, just the design. And so the number of companies that can realistically afford that is quite limited. The other challenge is that the know-how to design ships is really quite concentrated. Most companies just don't even know where to start. And so I think we shouldn't expect a large number of companies to move in that direction. Only if they've got unique demands for lots and lots of data processing that would justify the efficiency gains of having a chip that was suited for their purposes. But for most companies, using off-the-shelf chips will probably be a lot more efficient. So ultimately, the market share and the scale of earnings to those really big players who currently have it is going to stay that way. I think that's right. Why did you call it chip war? It's quite a statement. Well, you know, I, I think for a long time, the chip industry had just focused on selling chips for smartphones and PCs and had forgotten uh, the extent to which the industry has always been entangled in politics and in military affairs. And in my research, I learned that the first chips that were manufactured in large quantities were used for guidance computers in U.S. missile systems. And from that point, there's always been a deep interconnection between the Pentagon and the United States and the development of Silicon Valley. And today, when you look at how militaries, Chinese military to the U.S. military are trying to apply artificial intelligence to military systems, they're relying more and more on advanced semiconductors than ever before. And so most of us think about chips in the context of uh, looking at NVIDIA or AMD as companies, but governments think about chips in the context of military systems. And what you find looking at all of the new regulations and controls are coming out is that the chip industry is having to deal with a whole new set of questions and regulations that they've really forgotten about. And it's shaping the way companies do business. Do you have any advice for New Zealand? We're kind of just sitting at the bottom of the world watching and worrying about this happening. We don't have any of our own capacity in the chip supply chain. What should we do? <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of countries are looking right now at whether they can stockpile semiconductors in a way that would ensure them against a crisis in East Asia. And I think governments are still trying to figure out what's the best way to provide themselves some insurance. Uh, but as tensions rise in East Asia, I think we I can't simply assume they'll have access to the chips that we need. It is an interesting time we live in. Thank you so much, Chris, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I don't say this lightly, but Chris is the best guest I've had on this show yet. That interview absolutely blew my mind. I'd love to know what you thought of this episode. No doubt I'll definitely be doing more on the semiconductor space. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.